Hi, players. Welcome back to part two of our four-part series with Ken Mead, the lead investigator for Las Vegas Metro on the Route 91 Harvest Country Music Festival shooting. Before we get started, just some quick housekeeping. Head on over to Apple, Spotify, hit those five stars, especially for these episodes. Let us know what you think about them. Give us your feedback. Also, head on over to our website, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com. Follow us on social media at Game of Crimes on Twitter. Game of Crimes podcast on Facebook and Instagram. Also follow us on Game of Crimes at patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We've got a lot of content there in addition to our free content we provide on our podcast. Also head on over to Facebook and type in Game of Crimes fans. It's our fan group run by Sandy Salvato, our favorite mafia queen. So let's get back to our interview with Ken Mead. I think I think a lot of that has slowed down, yeah, because of yeah. everything that's gone on. A lot of people it got bad optics for some reason, and they're like, yeah. "Oh, you're just teaching them to be, you know, uh, you're teaching them commando techniques, you know, because they started looking at all the SWAT stuff, the gear people were getting, the tactics. Oh, you're just teaching them to be commandos and killers, you know." Yeah. Yeah, I think it was pretty hot and heavy after 9-11, obviously, yeah. right? Um, and then it, I think it's probably died down in some sense, and especially given the conflict there now. But yeah, so we'd go over and, you know, we were training and, you know, we were sitting in classes and going to locations in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and, you know, not actually going in there, but going onto the border crossings and, you know, getting taught by uh, traditional police officers. And so there's a lot of exposure, right? And they're living terrorism Every day, right? Every day. It's a much different dynamic than it is here in the United States. So the reason um, I wanted to talk about that for a little bit because I want to talk about the shooting too because I think there's some elements between both. You know what people think and the way you look at things. But um, how long were you there in Israel? It was two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. Um, and you train like they, they've got the Israeli National Police, but they've got like you know you've got the city police and other areas. Did you deal with Shin Bet or anybody yep. else? Like yeah, all of that. Yeah. So we had exposure to all that. You know, classes and lessons and instructions and kind of introductions and demonstrations from all those different organizations there. Yeah. What was the what were, what were one or two things you learned over there that really opened your eyes? <clears throat> I would say the culture. You know, I, I one I had never really uh, been over in the Middle East at all. Right. So, you know, you see it on TV. Uh, one, I found that, you know, what is certainly portrayed in the media is actually not probably what's the reality of what's going on on ground. You know, I would get up every morning and I would run from Tel Aviv to Jaffa, which is, you know, the kind of Arab part of the city. Um, and I had no issues. Right. And, you know, I found that, you know, even in uh, going to Jerusalem, you know, that all these people, for the most part, they all got along fairly well. You know, I mean, it, there's not this mass hate that was going on there, uh, like is you know generally portrayed sometimes in the media, right? Um, so I think that was probably one of the first things that I realized was that you know it's it's much different than what you see in the media, you know, because I went over there, you know, pretty concerned. My family was obviously very concerned that I was going over to the Middle East, um, you know, still relatively. Uh, going on where there were still relatively conflicts and, you know, suicide bombings and things were going on there. So it's a little bit of an element of uh, exposing yourself to unnecessary danger, right? Um, <clears throat> but it's kind of the risk-reward type thing. Um, so I think that would probably be one of the first things that the cultures, uh, you know, they actually fairly got along fairly well. And they're all right on top of each other. They're all living next to each other, right? And there's a lot of kind of co-mingling and interaction. Um, but one of the things, too, that was very, very uh, interesting to me was that, um, you know, the gun culture there, right? So, you know, everybody there has to do some sort of service in the military. Military, right, so you know, just walking around the city in general, um, it was certainly not like that in Vegas um, or anywhere that I grew up. But you know, I mean, you would regularly see military people with weapons, and you know, the culture itself is always very. I would say on edge, right? I mean, they're always very ready to kind of respond. I think, regardless of the age or demographic. Um, so there was a lot of times, you know, you were just going to walk into train stations and things, and there was always, it, it always seemed to be pe people that were very heavily armed, right? Always kind of ready and uh, prepared for action in the event that there was a terrorist incident occurring, you know? And yeah. I, we stayed mostly in Tel Aviv, but, um, you know, we were, we had exposure to other areas. They took us to the Golan Heights, you know, the disputed area with Syria. And so they, they took us to some, uh, definitely some dicey areas, which was great to see. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of culture there and there's just the, I think the culture of the people there is a very different mindset. Like you said, having to live terrorism every single day, every it's a legitimate day. threat. Yeah. Did you ever watch the series Spy on Netflix with uh, Sasha uh, Cohen? I have not, no. 
It's about Eli Cohen, um, the great spy from Israel that was okay. able to penetrate Syrian. <clears throat> uh, he actually ended up becoming the assistant uh, defense minister for Syria. Oh, wow. And one of his, one of the greatest uh, op- ops he pulled was he, he was a successful businessman, got in good with the guy who ended up becoming president. He said, hey, your soldiers are too hot here. So he got them to plant a <laughs> palm tree above every c- covert artillery position and so oh, wow. Nicole on Heights so that when yeah. war came, Israel was able to target exactly where those bunkers were. Wow. Yeah, you that's know, great. You made that one statement there that the media portrays it one way when it's really not that way. That's a shock, oh. isn't it? Shocking. Yeah, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was definitely not like that. I mean, we, I remember driving to, uh, I think we were headed out towards West Bank and uh, a rocket came over and I, as the bus was driving by, you know, you could still see the remnants from the rocket and they were very uh, unsophisticated at the time, right? They were just kind of throwing them over. Um, but I remember seeing it smoking on the side of the road, again, kind of thinking to myself, you know, I, <laughs> I'm paying for this experience, right? It's not it's definitely a much different experience than Disneyland, you know, as I progressed throughout my career. Yeah. Did yeah. you feel the urge to get out and clean up some stuff while you were over there? <laughs> yes. Sweep up some of the damage. Yeah, I know. Uh, I was uh, I was content to stay on the bus with the armed guards. Uh, I'll bet you were. Continue driving. You're probably thinking there's something you won't see every day. Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah. I had to do a briefing for some folks who were going over to Tel Aviv. I went over there with them, uh, and it was just so I did some research and come to find out everybody. To your point, everybody's got this thing. I said, guys, what's what's the number one crime in Israel? Oh, it's murder. It's terrorism. I said, no, it's corruption. That is the that is the biggest crime. That That is the most prevalent form of crime over there. Because again, I said, so I started off the briefing by going, hey, guys, here's the briefing. So you're going to Tel Aviv. Let me give you just a couple things. Last weekend, there were uh, 17 people shot, six people killed. And they go, oh, my God, that's terrible. I said, no, that was Chicago. Yeah. And none of you guys would have any problem flying to Chicago, going to the, you know, whatever, right? But you hear that, you hear that. And so they have this you know, this perception is that, oh, it's dangerous the whole time. Well, danger is a, is relative, and they've learned to adapt to the danger. They've learned to adapt to the risk, to your point, through their culture, which I always thought was fascinating talking to some of the Israelis over there. Yeah, absolutely. And they were great with us. I mean, they love Americans. We were always well-received there. But, you know, they certainly took us to, I remember going to certain spots uh, on the beach right next to the time. It was the U.S. Embassy there um, in Tel Aviv. And uh, the I think it was called Joe's Cafe or Joe's Bar or something, but it had been suicide bombed uh, fairly recently before we got there. And I remember having to go, be, they, so they wanted us to go there and see it, right? And explain be exposed to you know, how they kind of how they lived and the reality of of terrorism day to day and i remember going into every single location that you went into you either got it patted down you got wanded i mean even for just simple restaurants you know coffee whatever else every business you went in i mean they were pretty hyper vigilant um uh, with security measures there, uh, which again was something that again I had never really experienced in my life, uh, you know, having lived in you know cushy Southern California my whole life. Well, can you imagine? <clears throat> again, they're dealing with that. Imagine the effect that it's going to have in the United States the first time you have a true suicide bomber walk into a place and kill fifteen, twenty people, not with mm-hmm. a gun, but yeah. with an IED. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's going to certainly change the uh, the paradigm of the way the United States looks at things. I think you know, well, yeah. especially if it. You know, the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the truth of the matter is, just like 9-11 here in the United States, everybody was pro-American. We all came together, you know, let, let's protect ourselves. And then as generations continue to go, you know, the young people today think that was a movie. Mm-hmm. You know, and they, they lose their focus. They real, they don't realize what it is to be a patriot or, or to, you know, protect our own. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can recall... So I was in patrol. I was in my third year of patrol when 9-11 happened. I remember everybody loved us at the time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, that stuff quickly fades. And yeah. People forget. People get, people get amnesia pretty quick. Well, you remember, Morgan, in, in the D.C. area where we were, it's, you could drive down the toll road and there were American flags on every bridge All over you the went place. on. Every People's place. car antennas everywhere. Well, I still, I mean, uh, maybe I'm, I think I, I look around our neighborhood, there's still a few, but man, one of the flags I fly out, it's either it's a thin blue line flag or it's an American flag. It is always displayed, mm-hmm. you know, out in front of the house. Um, yep. And I just, uh, but I'm like you, yeah, we drove around here. And, and even that day, I remember going to sleep that night. I was uh, down in the Reagan building. We walked across the bridge, saw the Pentagon burning, you know, just watching that whole response. And it, it was that eerie sound is that I live by Dulles Airport. And so I was used to hearing jets come in, but to hear combat air patrol, hear the crisp sound of a jet fighter, an F-16 flying combat. And that's to me where it said, hey, that's why I said, never again, man. See, that's Israel's stance too. Never again. 
you know, uh, and then guess what? We've got the October 7th massacre, which unfortunately in history, we're going to tie back to October 1st. The reason I wanted to dive into this a little bit, get your perspective, is because when we start talking about October 1st, And the number of people that were killed, one of the first questions is going to be, is this terrorism? You know, was this a terrorist attack? That's one of, you know, on on September 1st, 2001, nobody, you know, a plane would go down. That would not be the first question. The first question would be, oh, what happened? A black box, an engine go out. On September 12th, the plane goes down, like when that TWA crashed. Is it terror? Every every question after that was, is it terrorism? So let's start, let's start leading into this now. So you get into investigations, start walking us up, up to that date. What kind of training did you get? And I'm very interested too, to understand what kind of, uh, between to the extent that you know, but what kind of training did SWAT have to do, or even some of your officers have to do considering all the high rise buildings, all of the casinos, all of the places in there, if something were to happen, I mean, how much training can you do? How much can you actually prepare for, for one of these incidents? Yeah, so I, you know, I get, I get transitioned over uh, and uh, assigned to our counterterrorism section, right? And at the time, it was very heavy into um, uh, international terrorism, right? That was the big focus, right? Um, all the fusion centers were being stood up, and DHS funded it, and it was all based on, you know, the the response to international terrorism. Um, and again, that has changed drastically as well, right? The function of the fusion center. So, um, you know, I think I did probably a year, year and a half, maybe, uh, in our. Uh, so Las Vegas Metro has their own counterterrorism section. And then uh, they have several people at the time. I think we had five people assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force with the FBI. And so um, probably about a year and a half in, I was asked to go over to um, the JTTF. And uh, initially, I was told that I was going to go over to the uh, International Terrorism Squad, which I wanted to do, right? Because that was a sexy thing. Everybody wanted to work in international terrorism. Um, but a senior a detective to me said, no, 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 nice try. I'm going to bump you and you're going to be going to the domestic terrorism squad. And I didn't really know much about domestic terrorism. You know, it wasn't really a big thing and it wasn't really a hot topic, but uh, they had two teams. So um, I ended up ultimately getting assigned to the domestic terrorism squad. And it really was a blessing in disguise because I was able to really kind of stand out and be a, a stellar uh, task force officer with the, with the GTTF on that squad. So um, I get assigned ultimately to the domestic terrorism squad ultimately you know at the time we were working kind of white supremacy and uh, militia type activity um you know vegas is uh, nevada itself is still a very wild wild west type mentality right so we're open carry and um you know, uh, very pro gun. And so, um, you know, militias and prostitution were big... is legal in many places it, it, outside of Clark County. Yes. Yeah. So I yep. think uh, there's, uh, I think in Clark County, it's not. And Washoe County, which is Reno is it's not, but I think otherwise in the state it is. Um, but nobody cares. Everybody thinks it's legal everywhere in the state. So yeah, there you I go. Mean, That's why it keeps I, our, it, I say it's, it's legal, you know, <laughs> in a lot of places, right? It keeps our vice section very busy <laughs> to say the <laughs> least. Um, so I ended up going over to domestic terrorism i uh, started working white supremacy and militia type activity uh and then ultimately uh, kind of my bread and butter for uh majority of the time that i was on the G- i was on the gctf for about 10 years um up to including to when i retired uh i was working sovereign citizens and it was a, a massive thing that oh, we were dealing with you know that is daily- a whole nother yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that could be a whole nother episode. Just just even watching those guys go to court and talk yes. to judges, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm here, I'm not, you know, the person, I'm a traveler, I'm representing, I'm a, a corporation, you know, all of this legal mumbo jumbo. Yeah, it was uh, definitely something that nobody really wanted to do because of all the headaches that are associated with that, with getting sued and getting leaned and, you know, all kinds of other nonsense that occurs uh, off duty as well, not just professionally, but personally, all the stuff you have to deal with when they, you know, do research on you and they find out, you know, where you live and, you know, your family stuff and your all your personal information, your social security number and stuff. So, um, you know, I did that, you know, hot and heavy and furious for, you know, probably a good eight years or so. I mean, we were smashing them and, you know, we were very, very aggressive here in, in Vegas with sovereign citizens. And, uh, you know, again, made a name for myself nationwide and became a subject matter expert and, you know, got to have some amazing cases. Uh, what was working the major threat citizens. that the sovereign citizens posed for you guys in your jurisdiction? What was their, you know, raison d'etre? What was their reason for being? What were they there to do? Yeah, so we saw a little bit of everything. I mean, we saw everything from people that just wanted to be difficult on car stops, right? And just not uh, be non-compliant and, you know, not provide their driver's license and not believe they had to have a driver's license. But, you know, we had uh, two of our officers that were killed. So Alan Beck and Igor Soldo were killed uh, by two uh, people that had a militia slash sovereign slash domestic terrorism ideology. Um, they were ambushed at a pizza place. 
uh, and Alan and I were very close. We were actually TAC officers at Academy together. So that, you know, obviously affected me and not just personally, but professionally as well. So it kind of motivated me even more so to engage even um, at a higher level in trying to uh, kind of defeat this movement here in Vegas. But, you know, I, I can say that everything we did, uh, it just, you know, the more we arrested them and the more we smashed them, it seemed like the more the ideology spread, right? I mean, it's just, it was, the I think, the time and, you know, uh, it was online everywhere. Um, you know, people were holding seminars here. But um, I, I think a lot of it was based on finances. You know, at the time that the sovereign citizen movement exploded in Vegas was the same time the housing market crashed, right? So um, people were using a lot of the ideology to their own benefit, trying to get out of their mortgages, trying to get out of their student loan debt, trying to get out of uh, their, you know, their car loans. So I think there were people that genuinely were trying to do it because they believed that it did work. But then you also had people that generally believed in the ideology that, you know, the government didn't exist and just wanted to kind of do their own thing and be above the law and outside of the jurisdiction of the United States and kind of do their own thing and get away with it for very self-serving purposes. Yeah, because the sovereign citizens, a more violent kind of version of the posse comitatus, we dealt with those out in Kansas. They would say, you know, hey, you're not the only constitutionally elected officer is the sheriff. I don't recognize your authority. I said, no problem. I'll call you a constitutional wrecker as we yeah. take you to the constitutional jail. But yeah. they, were, they were less <laughs> of a problem. You know, they, they would want to file lawsuits, but they would they were not, at least back in my time, they were not as aggressive and as as uh, uh, dangerous as sovereign citizens. Yeah, yeah, we saw it a lot. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, just like every other group, um, you know, our gangs or whoever else, you know, there was a handful of people that we knew that were involved in the organizations and the ideology uh, that were violent that we dealt with. But I mean, it was almost a daily occurrence where we were getting notifications from patrol officers about, you know, I'm dealing with this sovereign on this car stop. So, you know, we ended up ultimately, you know, identifying the kind of problem children that were in the movement that we really tried to focus on and target on and put really good cases on to send them to prison. And, you know, we had some really great cases that we built. Um, were most of them a, federal or most of them state? No. So I, I think uh, probably 90, 5% of them were state. Uh, you know, we have really great uh, uh, laws here in Nevada addressing uh, terrorism, uh, whether it's domestic or international, uh, which the federal government does not have, right? Especially on the domestic terrorism side. So, um, having the benefit of being a task force officer, you know, we were able to uh, build cases on the FBI and prosecute them with our um, district attorney's office. Uh, our district attorney, again, uh, was very forward thinking and they ended up ultimately assigning uh, at one point three to three, um, uh, uh, district attorneys uh, to just prosecute. Uh, they came out of the gang unit, but they just prosecuted our terrorism cases. So we had very specific people that uh, we could go to that knew the ideology, that knew the dynamic, that received the same training that we did. They received the same clearances that we did. And so they were in the mix just as much. And I think it really helped and continues to help um, us combat um, any sort of sort of ideological based crimes in Vegas, because we have, uh, you know, great uh, support from the district attorney's office here in, in, in the Southern Nevada. I think, you know, for our listeners, that's significant too, that the district attorney would, would assign specific attorneys there and they're granted the clearances. Cause typically, you know, you go in and whoever has the lightest caseload catches the next case coming into an attorney's uh, district or Posh King attorney's office. So, you know, kudos and hats off to the to the district attorney's office there for having the foresight to do that and the commitment to follow through. I think they used to call that vertical integration, too. You'd want to get somebody in there just from the beginning that would follow the case all the way through the end. To your point, Murph, you don't want to say, okay, somebody shows up for a prelim, somebody shows up for this. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you get done, you've got five people that have been on the case and nobody's really dived into it or understands the entire culture. They used to do that with some gang stuff out here, too, with MS-13. This is before I think Mike Chapman got on, but... Um, but they, they, that was the big problem out here is you'd get prosecutors, uh, Commonwealth attorneys, mm -hmm. what they call them out here. You didn't want to get that hodgepodge. You'd want somebody who was vertically integrated into the entire process from the time of arrest through the time of trial or conviction, you know. Well, we even had the we had that same issue in the in the uh, U.S. attorney's offices as well. If the drug prosecutors were all tied up, I mean, and they had massive caseloads depending on where you were stationed. But if you got a white collar attorney assigned to one of your cases, now all of a sudden, you're doing everything. You you have to be the one ready to prosecute the What's case. What's a kilo? What's a kilo? <laughs> yeah, and, and the defense attorneys will call you for plea agreements. They don't even call that that specific attorney. So it's, I mean, it's, it is a big deal. That's the whole point here. Yeah, they were great with us, and they, uh, you know, they continue to do that, and uh, they continue to support those efforts. 
Um, but again, I think the laws that are on the books certainly help us out now because um, we're able to charge a lot of things. And this actually goes right into kind of the conversation for October 1 is that, um, you know, we were uh, potentially any mass shooting in Southern Nevada that we look at um, or any sort of mass violence can be charged as a terrorism offense with the way that the laws are written in, in, uh, in, uh, in Nevada. Excellent. Yeah, and let's talk to let's 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 start talking about that now. But a real quick clarification: so when you're a task force officer uh, with uh, FBI, you get some extra credentials and some extra authority, right? Yes. So I was deputized as a federal agent, so I pretty much could do everything, um, with the exception of two things off the top of my head, which I won't discuss. That I that the FBI agents could do that I couldn't do, which was very minimal. It didn't ever impact my ability to operate. Well, in no, the we field. know what one of them is. It's put out a press release. That's the one thing they didn't want you doing. <laughs> I was going to well, say I don't know that, the case. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that the bureau puts out many press releases in general, but um, yeah, I mean they they uh, I, I love my time on the FBI. You know, a lot of people uh, will, will will knock it, but I had a great time. Uh, they treated me like family. You know, I never felt any different. And, um, you know, at one point, I remember that one of the uh, ASACs, you know, approached me and said, how do you have more stats than any of our FBI agents do? And a lot of it was because, you know, we were able to do so much more um, at the state level than they can on the federal level. You know, I mean, they're well, not. And that was the great by... thing about having two badges, right? right. Is that if, if, the Fed, if the Fed stuff put handcuffs on you, you just revert over to your, you know, your, your traditional commission to say, look, I can do stuff you guys can't do. Yes. And, you know, we can get a search warrant in, you know, nine, 10 minutes, whereas sometimes on the Fed side, it'd take you nine, 10 days. Let's so, talk about uh, a Title III. Murph would yeah, love to use yeah. a guys to write Title III wiretaps because it was much easier. Uh, yes. the, so, and, and for our listeners here, too, we love our FBI brethren. So we're just busting their tops here. A little. But it yeah, is required no. that once an episode, we make fun of the FBI. That's written in our contract. So. Yeah, no, they were great. I love all those guys. They were all, you know, everyone, all the agents that I worked with, I can't say that I ever had a bad experience with any of the FBI agents that I work with. And like I said, they treated me like family the entire time I was there. So nice. it was a good experience. So what's the, what's the uh, longest trip you took under, uh, as a task force officer for the JTTF? How, what, what's the, was there an interesting trip you got to take, at, you know, other than not going to Ottumwa, Iowa, but did you get to travel and go to an interesting place based on some of your casework? Oh, uh, uh, so we had one that I was supposed to go to Nigeria on, um, which was a fraud case where somebody was it involved $20 million at a prince had that you got an email on, right? You well, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not that far off, but they were, uh, they were, um, uh, kind of using fake fraudulent university, uh, email addresses to, uh, obtain student loans. Ma no material that could be used for nefarious purposes. And so we were concerned about that, but it ended up going from, uh, we opened the case in Vegas. It went from Vegas to London, then London down to, um, to Lagos. Um, we were able to track it very well to London, but once it got out of London, you mm -hmm. know, we really lost visibility on it. So, um, I was prepared to go to London and, or I'm sorry, was prepared to go to Nigeria for, for training. And they sent me to, uh, their, uh, training school. The FBI sent me to their school for overseas travel, and uh, which was another great experience as well. Um, but uh, it kind of fizzled at the end. So um, I didn't, I, you know, most of my travel that I took for the FBI was was um, was domestic travel. Um, you know, I didn't really go out of country, although I had a, um, a an official passport uh, that was initially issued at the time. When I hired on as TFOs, we could get official passports uh, from the State Department. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think most of it was, so the farthest that I probably went was we had our, um, our, uh, Bunkerville, uh, bu kind of standoff we had here where, uh, there was a sovereign citizen group that confronted BLM, uh, here and, uh, confronted them. So we ended up doing a lot of travel, uh, to do interviews on, uh, subject interviews to do arrests. Uh, and I think, uh, probably the furthest I went on that was Connecticut, I think. Um, but there was a lot of, uh, travel in the United yeah. States, um, mostly to teach, but, um, there was some operational travel as well. All right. Well, let's, let's just dive into it now. So let's just ask the penultimate question. Where were you on October 1st, 2017? So, uh, I was home actually. Uh, I had, uh, so a couple weeks prior, we had, um, the Tokyo police department, um, and, uh, Japanese authorities in Vegas doing some training, preparing for the Tokyo Olympics. So they were doing some training with the Las Vegas, uh, FBI SWAT team. Um, and so they were downstairs at the FBI office and I kind of wandered down cause 
one, uh, you know, I, I, I always loved the international stuff. So I kind of wandered down. Uh, I knew a bunch of the Las Vegas FBI SWAT guys, and they were doing some uh, combat medic training downstairs and teaching uh, their SWAT teams on how to kind of address stuff in the field. So I wandered down. I ended up talking to one of the interpreters. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a long story, but I'll make it short. Uh, I ended up talking to one of the interpreters. said, hey, I've always wanted to kind of come to Japan. It's always been on my bucket list to go. I exchanged information with one of the interpreters who was a police officer in Tokyo. Um, met some, kept in contact with him and ended up reaching out uh kind of several months later and said, Hey, I'm, I, I want to come over to Tokyo. And so I booked my flight over and it was kind of this, uh, pseudo, uh, professional slash personal trip. So I, I went over for personal reasons, paid for it on my own. Uh, but once I got there, they took care of me. I had a driver. They took me wherever I wanted. I got to go to police stations and do ride alongs with, uh, the Tokyo police and, uh, I, it's stuff that I would have never have seen had I not, you know, had I just gone as a tourist. Right. So, uh, great experience. So I had just flown back from Tokyo. Um, I'm Probably detecting within, a pattern here, though. Anytime there's some good training <laughs> to go to, you end up seeming to have to pay for it yourself. Uh, yeah, a couple of it. the good ones, yes, and I didn't mind it. You know, Vegas, uh, Vegas PD paid pretty well, so I, I couldn't complain. Um, so I just come back from Tokyo. Um, I was getting ready for bed, and uh, again, Bruce, you know, and uh, Steve, feel free to give him uh, shit about it because you know maybe he's the uh, maybe he's the Grim Reaper and all this, but you mm-hmm. know, Bruce again circles back around, and uh, you know, I'm going to I'm getting to bed. It's probably shortly after 10 p.m. and uh, he calls me and says, "Hey, are you working this active shooter?" And I had no idea. You know, I was off duty. It was I was at home. I think it was a Sunday night. Um, and so, uh, you know, I have a take home car, I have a, my radio, all my equipment in the, in the car. And so I, uh, I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He's like, go get your radio and listen to it. Cause I don't know if he was on duty at the time and they were working. I think he was working at the time. I think he was working narcotics. Um, but he says, Hey, go get your radio. So I go get my radio. I run out to my car. Uh, I turn the radio on and it's literally, I mean, it, it, it's hard to describe, the amount of chaos and pandemonium and fear and despair and uh, I get screaming on the radio that you hear. Um, so I hear, you know, just again, chaos on the radio, just screaming, right? Um, In all your years, had you ever heard radio traffic like that before? Absolutely not. I mean, not during officer-involved shootings, not during, you know, major incidents, nothing. I'd never heard anything like it. I mean, it was almost as if somebody had got on the radio with no training and was just screaming on the radio. Um, and, And again, I mean, our department, to go back to your earlier question, our department trains very well, right? And we're used to operating in hotels and casinos. And, um, you know, we had done a lot of active shooter training in hotels. So right before usually the hotels get imploded here in Vegas, they open it up to our department and we do training. So we bound room to room. And so we have all... Uh, you know, for the most part, receive training on how to do overwatch and bounding and tactical training inside schools or hotels or motels, you know, before they're imploded. So we, we have received training in that stuff. And the great um, part about that is you can actually can use some of the live munitions too, like throw a real flashbang and do stuff absolutely. like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so we're doing live units or we're doing uh, simunitions or, um, you know, whatever. And our SWAT team, I mean, again, they're going in, they're doing their tactical breaches and they're doing that sort of stuff as well. So, um, you know, we had some exposure to it. But again, I never worked downtown or on, on the strip. So I really, day to day, it wasn't really a focus of, you know, something that I was thinking about tactically, right? Um, so I hear all the screaming on the radio and I realize like, shit, I got to, and, and I, I live outside of town. I'm probably a good, you know, even rolling code, I'm probably a good, you know, 20, 30 minutes from the strip. And so, uh, you know, by the time I, I, I figured by the time I got down there that, you know, the event itself was probably going to be over or there was going to be far, um, far greater uniform police officers down there than I, you know, why do I need to go down there? Right. I mean, what am I going to do? Right. There's already going to be hundreds and hundreds of cops that are going to be down there. Right. In the 20, 30 minutes it's going to take me to drive down there. Um, so my thought was I got to one, I got to 
get myself ready, right? And so I, I literally threw on, uh, I think, a pair of jeans and a T-shirt and my, my tack vest. Um, I grabbed my rifle, my radio, my rifle. Um, I put my rifle actually in my helmet. I took my ballistic helmet and my rifle, put it on my front seat because I didn't know, right, what was going on. We, we, My first thought was this is a Mumbai-style attack, right, because I was hearing multiple locations, where there was active shooters going on on the strip, right? So my thought is it's Mumbai, right? We're getting hit by multiple organizations, multiple entities, multiple cells, and it was probably going to be terrorism. Which Mumbai, too, that was Lashkari Taiba. That was, I mean, a well-coordinated, well-rehearsed attack, um, run basically controlled out of Pakistan, uh, you know, into Mumbai, India against the Taj, you know, because a lot of folks, you say Mumbai, we know what you're talking about. We just wanted to ground folks. That was a another terrorist attack, but that continued over like, you know, a couple days. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, we, you know, my first thought was, this is what it is. You know, again, our department is very, very, um, uh, great with looking at what future of policing looks like. Right. Very, I think forward thinking our police department was. Um, and so we had sent, uh, I didn't go personally, but we had sent, uh, people from our unit and people from our department to Mumbai to do after actions and kind of post tick that event to do lessons learned. So, you know, they'd brought that stuff back with us. Um, and I, I think realistically, you know, we have always, seen Vegas appear on ISIS inspired propaganda and, you know, inspire magazine. And, you know, Vegas has always kind of been uh, talked about as being a potential target, right? Cause one, we're the sin city, right? We're everything that uh, they, uh, that terrorists uh, want to defeat, right? They kind but they of also got a shitload of people there all the time, sh- shitload of people all the time. Right. And, you know, gambling and all these things that, culturally generally are not accepted right so we always kind of felt like we were a target um at some point right to well i was going to say here's a here's a factoid that'll shock you do you know where inspire magazine used to be published out of no north carolina no interesting believe it or not i mean that's that's where they would do this hey because this is a good point too i wanted to ask you before you you get into the rest of the story but prior to this time uh, even with your assignment had you received any chat or any intel that las vegas or uh this harvest festival was going to be a target of anything had you, had anything appeared on the radar no so the harvest festival no uh, we we'd always heard chatter here and there right i mean especially around new year's eve time right we'd always i i distinctly remember one new year's eve uh working when i was in the gang unit so it probably would have been yeah, 2008, 2009, one of our lieutenants kind of gathered us all around and said, hey, we're getting chatter that, you know, you got, the strip is going to get attacked for New Year's Eve. And I remember a lieutenant, which was, again, it makes your eyes widen to think about a lieutenant saying this now. But I remember our lieutenant at the time, uh, she told us, listen, uh, we're going to be under attack tonight. Something's going to happen on the strip. So all you guys have the green light, which, again, is unheard of, right? Wow. That they just kind of said, do what you got to do to handle any business if anything happens, right? And the strip gets attacked tonight. So, um, you know, I remember our, our group, and I'm not overly religious, but I remember uh, one of the guys in the group led a group prayer again, which is unheard of, right? That a squad sits down and kind of has a prayer. We were that worried about it that year um, for the strip. Um, so, again, we've always heard chatter. And again, it's usually around New Year's Eve. Uh, but again, the Route 91 Harvest Festival had uh, occurred several years prior to this. And you know, historically, it was not an event that we ever had any issues with because of the, I think, the demographics, right? It was always usually country western, right? Which is usually a fairly... Got some Bubba's drinking beer, maybe a couple yes, pints, right? but nothing big, hold, right? Hold my beer, and that was about it, right? So it was always usually country western fans, right? Um, it was always usually uh, very heavy on uh, off-duty and on-duty law enforcement that were there at the, the concert itself, right? And it was always very heavily military, right? So um, it wasn't something we we worried about um or ever really i don't think probably considered very much um that this particular event and this particular venue would get attacked in the way it was well let's dive into it then so i mean you got your helmet you got your uh carbine i mean you're geared up you're ready to go so um what was the decision did you get called in or did you just decide screw it i'm going in yeah, so there was a little bit of a decision before that. Um, so I have a son, and I was home with him and putting him to bed. And so I didn't have anybody to uh, kind of manage him you know, while he was by himself. So I had to call my grandmother at, at the time, and she rushed over and was able to manage him. Um, but I remember, you know, we, we all talk about in law enforcement about how cliched it is. You know, you can, you know, you can go to work and never come home and stuff. And, yeah, I mean, it, it's true, right? But uh, I, he was... 
seven at the time. Um, you know, he heard the radio traffic. He's very clever, uh, smart kid. And, uh, you know, he heard all this going on and he could probably tell, I mean, he's very in tune. He could tell dad was, uh, was flustered and dad's dynamic changed. And, you know, he knew that, that something wasn't right. And so he told me, dad, don't go. You're going to get killed. You're going to get, you're not going to come home. And so that is a very difficult thing. And that's probably one of the few times in my entire law enforcement career where I had, you know, a slight pause thinking that, you know, this might be the last time that I get to see family. Right. So, um, Difficult decision, right? Um, but uh, I was not deployed down there. Um, we have policies and procedures in place for self-deployment, especially with our unit. Um, you know, we tend to be the ones that tend to be the tip of the spear when major events occur. And, you know, inevitably anything that happens on the Strip, if it's a major event, you know, they want at least somebody from counterterrorism there just to be there in case it is terrorism related or to kind of manage um manage uh intelligence gathering with the fbi or federal agencies or whoever it is right because we have the ability to do that on the ggtf so um so my thought was you know i'm not going to make it down there on my own Uh, i didn't even bother to log in i i I figured well if somebody's gonna you know write me up or give me a contact or a discipline for not logging on and going to this event then you know i'll take it whatever um but I also knew that I wasn't going to make it down there in time. You know, I figured again that there was going to be hundreds of cops there before I even got there. So my first thought was, well, nobody's thinking about the investigation. Somebody's got to start the investigation, right, on this right away. And so I went uh, from my house, you know, code three, uh, again, rifle in the front seat, helmet, not knowing what was going on. And I ended up going to our police headquarters building, which is where our fusion center is, um, which is also where the counterterrorism section is. And, uh, you know, got there. I was the first one there. Um, didn't even bother to text anybody. I, when I, once I got there, I started, you know, kind of texting bosses and say, Hey, I'm here at the uh, headquarters. But you now when checked into our fusion watch desk and said, Hey, I'm here. Uh, you know, it was, you know, chaos over there as well. Cause they can monitor all the strip cameras and they can, you know, see all the tourist corridor and everything going on from the fusion watch desk. Um, so I, uh, I ended up, um, kind of just starting the investigation and, you know, uh, for, I think fairly shortly after, uh, once I got to headquarters, you know, people started to arrive and I started to let people know like, Hey, I'm going to take lead on this. And it's a little bit of an interesting dynamic, you know, there's, there's plenty of detectives that were lead on this, right? I mean, somebody was lead on the homicide, somebody was lead on the crime scene, you know, somebody was lead on, um, interviews and digital forensics and whatever. So there was lots of leads on this. Um, and we'll get into it, but several days later is when I kind of assumed the lead role that I ultimately had during this case. But, um, you know, once I got to the fusion center and, and, uh, sat down at my desk, uh, you know, I was watching the news. We have uh, TV cameras that are all set up that we can monitor, uh, open source media. So I was starting to kind of watch the body count rise and I'm thinking like, shit, how high is this going to go? Um, and you know, our, everybody started to arrive at headquarters, all of our big wigs in our administration and brass and supervisors. And so, uh, I think fairly shortly after somebody, uh, texted me a photo of the, um, bad guys, uh, driver's license. And so, um, at the same time, uh, I was given fairly close to the same time. I was given the driver's license photo for a uh, bad guy. I was given the name of his girlfriend, uh, her vehicle information, and I was given her Facebook page. And so I immediately started doing the investigative procedures uh, to try to jump on all those items. How, how, how close in time did that occur between when the shooting happened, you know, to when you got that information? Cause that sounds like a pretty, sh- I mean, I, I get finding out the shooter cause you'd kind of know what room that's going to be in, but the girlfriend information and the other stuff, how close in time was that from the event to when you got the information? Oh, that was pretty close. So, I mean, it would have taken me probably 20, 30 minutes to drive down there. And then I had it fairly quickly. So probably within the first 30 minutes, I had some stuff that I could at least start working on the investigator side. Um, do you have you know, to make contact with the, because you're also a task force officer, you know, with the JTTF. So uh, what kind of FBI notifications or liaison is going on at this point? You know, to be honest, I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, I know I notified my uh, police bosses, right? But I also have supervisors of the FBI. Um, I did not initially go over to the FBI office. Uh, it was my understanding they were setting up a command post as well, right? An uh, operations center over there. But, um, you know, my primary concern was uh, being at the headquarters building and starting the investigation. Because, again, we didn't know what we had at this point, right? We didn't know if uh, girlfriend was involved. We didn't know if there were more shooters. We didn't really know what we had. 
And so all I really had to go on was her Facebook page, which I immediately jumped on and uh, started monitoring. Um, and then again, his driver's license, uh, I started doing preservation requests to Facebook to make sure that her account didn't disappear, which ironically enough, it did shortly after I got on it. Um, um, and then, you know, again, I had his address, so I knew at some point we're going to need to do a search warrant on his residence. Right. So I started working the process, the legal process to try to get information on, to confirm that is where he lived. And then ultimately, um, dra- started drafting the search warrant for his residence up in Mesquite. Um, how, again, let's go back to how close in time from the time the event started, you get involved. How long did it take before you were satisfied? There was just one shooter. Um, I would probably say it took a while, right? Cause we didn't really know. Um, there was a lot of false reporting going on. That's exactly what I'm getting into. Yeah. yeah. So, but so a lot of that false reporting, uh, this is kind of a multi-pronged answer, I guess. So we were hearing on the radio that there were multiple shooters, right? Now let's let, let me let me add just a word to what Mercer saying. When we talk about false reports, too, I'm talking about some of these conspiracy theories to come out and say, well, there's a second shooter and a third shooter. You know, when an incident like this, obviously a huge incident, yeah. people truly think, hey, there's a shooting over here. They report incorrect information, but under the belief that hey, it's true. So we did not hear that initially, right? Our initial reports of a uh, another shooter, or second shooter, or multiple shooters was based on radio traffic and stuff that we were hearing from officers that were on scene, right? Because they were reporting, no, it's coming from inside the venue, and this is all stuff that you can listen to um, that's out there in in uh, you know in uh, on the internet. Um, you know, we were hearing multiple shooters that there were shooters inside the venue, that there were shooters at multiple locations in the hotels, that the shooter was up in Mandalay Bay. You know, we were hearing all these different conflicting reports um to me it didn't really matter because my focus was on the bad guy right my focus was on him and figuring out who he was was there anyone else i could attribute to him was he associated to any sort of um terrorist events i i know fairly quickly on that you know i end up calling over to the fbi radio room and you can call in and say hey i need you to do a workup on this person for me um so i know that that was started uh, fairly quickly as well once i had that information um, but I think for me, as far as being comfortable knowing that we only had one shooter was probably, um, maybe an hour or two after the event, probably when, uh, so one of our SWAT officers, Levi Hancock, who, uh, Levi Hancock, who I teach with, um, he's the one that breached the room, explosive breached the room. Uh, once they got in and, uh, found out that the suspect was down, I think we were pretty comfortable because, you know, we weren't getting any other reports of shootings after that. Uh, we, we were fairly confident that the main shooter was down. Um, we had received information from, uh, suspect's girlfriend's daughter that she was out of country. So we also were fairly confident that she was not involved at the time as well. So I'd say probably within the first two hours that we were fairly confident that we only had one shooter. Although, you know, again, we were constantly hearing these things come out. Um, you know, we weren't dispelling anything and we were keeping an open mind about it. Right. Um, but I, I think from my level of comfort, it was probably within the first couple hours. Well, I, you know, I'm a good indicator as far as shooters was once the shooting stopped at Mandalay Bay, there was no additional shooting. No, no. Yeah. And, you know, that was, it was as bad as it sounds. I mean, that was a good sign for us that we were confident that, you know, that it was at least that wave of it. You know, if there was a second wave, at least that wave of it was over. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, everybody was there. Right. I mean, it wasn't just myself that self-deployed. Right. I mean, we had hundreds and probably thousands of police officers from around the valley that heard that this was going on and just self-deployed, right? And Mm -hmm. came to wherever they could to help out. So, um, you know, I don't pretend to be one that was down there taking rounds and, you know, on scene and doing all this, you know, uh, heroic stuff that the officers that were actually at the scene were doing. Um, You know, there was a lot of us that responded in a lot of different ways to contribute to the, the outcome of this case. Yeah. What was your initial impression um, just starting to work it up with this shooter? Um, did you, because we talked about, you know, your assignment to domestic terrorism. Did you believe there was a nexus to terrorism or did you did you not feel that early on? No, I think my gut feeling was probably not. Um, you know, once I started looking into him, um, one of the interesting things that, that happened was, you know, so I get, I we have her information, right? 
we, you know, within the maybe first hour or two, we find out that she's out of country, right? Her daughter ends up calling in. So we, we have her license plate. We have the girlfriend's license plate. So we're trying to attempt to locate where the vehicle is at, right? Um, when the officers went in the room, they find multiple gaming cards, you know, players' cards, gambling cards, uh, under his name and her name. And so, you know, our first priority was where is she at, right? Uh, once we started putting her information out into the media, right, I remember seeing her license plate on CNN and, uh, you know, like, hey, we're looking for this lady. We're looking for um, the girlfriend. Um, her daughter ends up calling in to, uh, I don't know if it was the media or our police department. Um, I think that by that time they had established a tip line as well. Um, but I think her daughter ends up calling in and says, no, 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 my mom is in the Philippines. She's not in country. And so, again, we were fairly confident that, you know, there wasn't um uh, kind of a conspiracy going on. I think our initial thought was maybe where is she at, you know, was she involved in the shooting as well? And I think that goes back to the San Bernardino Christmas party shooting, right? Where you have a male and female, um, a terrorist subjects, um, doing an attack, uh, which historically is very rare. Um, but I think once we found out she was out of country, you know, I started digging into uh, him. Uh, like I said, I was on her Facebook page. So I had, uh, I was on her Facebook page scrolling through, just trying to get any sort of intelligence I could based on who she was, what she was doing, where she was at, you know, before she was out of country. And then um, probably, I don't know, within the 30 minutes of me jumping on her Facebook page, it uh, went blank. It disappeared. It disapp- It completely vanished. So I, cl- you know, I clicked the link to try to refresh. I'm clicking on pictures. I go back and then it says, you know, oops, this profile is not available anymore. So initially I'm like, shit. You know, like where, like, what is her level of involvement? Like, why would she hide her why would, Facebook? Yeah, why would page? her first action be? Let me go delete my Facebook page. Absolutely. So there, there's a good answer to that, though. So uh, ultimately, when we get into interviews with her down the road, um, you know, we're putting all this stuff out to the media, right? So the same thing that I'm doing, jumping on her Facebook page, the media is doing. And so she was getting bombarded by media trying to reach out to her online. And she didn't really know what was going on. She had reported to us that um, she was actually going out to dinner in Manila. And her family member said, hey, you need to come home because your picture and your car is on CNN. And something is going on in Vegas. And so so she comes back home. And and that's what I was going to ask right there, too. So real quickly, you were able to verify that she actually was out of the country in the Philippines. We were fairly certain she was, right? I mean, we couldn't officially verify it, right? Because it takes us time to get records from DHS or travel documents or whatever. Right. Um, But I think we were fairly certain that she was out of country uh, at the time. Um, And then, you know, when we go back and we do interviews with her and I ask her that very question, like, hey, why did you delete your Facebook page? She said that media was just bombarding me with requests and people were saying nasty things and comments were coming on. So I just ended up um, putting my page on private and, you know, hiding it until I figured out actually what was going on in Vegas, which made sense to me. Yeah. So let's talk about the media. Sorry, the media portray or the media portrayed that as being very nefarious, right? That she was hiding something and she was involved. I just did too. I did do my first thought, but that makes perfect sense. And our bosses were the same way too, right? I mean, but we don't really know at that point, right? What was going on. And my first thought was, oh, you know, why would she hide it? So yeah, I mean, I, my head went to the same place you guys yeah. did. So, but, but let's just step back for a second and talk about, um, you know, nobody ever really appreciates the enormity of something when something first happens, because you just kind of got, get into it. You don't have time to sit back and reflect. You just start digging in. But how did you approach this? I mean, cause you, like you said, you, you, you came in and kind of staked the, the, you know, planted the flag, said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to lead this. How did you approach doing that? You know, what were your immediate things, things that you needed to get done from your standpoint, from an investigative side? Well, I think first and foremost, you know, we were one concerned that there was a second shooter, right? So once we, I think, believed that there wasn't, we knew we had to find out where this guy lived and we needed to get into his house, right? Because we need to find out what's going on with this person. Um, So Mesquite, Nevada is about an hour, hour, 10 minutes north of uh, Vegas, depending on where you're at in the valley. And it's a very small police department, right? Um, they have their own PD. Uh, I, I can't even tell you, maybe a couple hundred people. Um, and then during those hours on a graveyard shift, there's probably, you know, probably less than 10 officers that are actually on duty in that city at the time. Um, so uh, I, I knew that we were going to have to get into bad guy's house. 
right? So my first thought was, aside from everything else, right, the enormity of everything going on, the chaos of everything going on, I was really hyper-focused on, I need to be the one that drafts this search warrant to get into his house because we really need to find out what's going on here, right? Because there could be other bodies, there could be other people, there could be a manifesto, there could be, you know, whatever else at his residence. So, um, you know, all these things are running through my mind, but my first thought was, I know at some point somebody is going to need a search warrant for this guy's house. And so that's what I started working on. Um, so, you know, I was getting fed information from the scene and I was getting text messages and people were calling me, kind of giving me intelligence. But at that point, to be honest, I mean, the the severity and the gravity of the situation and the numbers that we were seeing with people that were being killed and that were passing away and the numbers were continually rising, I knew I needed you know, probably just the bare minimum amount of probable cause to get into that residence, right? I knew that I was probably going to get a lot of leeway uh, in trying to get into that residence. Uh, and I think we probably could have went on an exigent circumstance, right, to get into the residence without doing a search warrant. But again, we wanted to err on the side of caution and know that, you know, in case there is a second shooter and we do need some sort of evidence that, you know, the search warrant's always the best way to go to get into mm-hmm. somebody's residence. Are you going the state or federal route on the warrant? No, we were doing state all the way. Okay. Yeah, at, to my, at that point, you know, the feds hadn't really done anything. They hadn't really, I think, opened a case. I know that they were starting to open up a command center. Because um, my thought again, is because at some point, ATF uh, is going to play a role in this, too, because just the weaponry involved. They do, yes, absolutely. And they played a vital role and helped us out quite a bit with all the weapons and doing the um, the checks and finding out where they all came from and when they were purchased and the legality of them all, especially with the issue with the bump stocks. Um, you know, they were vital into that. Um, but yeah, initially it was all just local run. I mean, we, we ran with it. I was there and we just started figuring out. Cause I, again, I knew that if we were going to get a federal search warrant, I didn't believe that at that time there was any federal nexus to it yet, but I knew we had at least a state charge. Right. And I knew the strength of our state of Nevada laws on terrorism. So I think even regardless, and because I had been on the GTTF and we had done cases before where we prosecuted state terrorism cases based on federal crimes, Um, I was confident that I could write a search warrant that would um, withstand scrutiny in both state and federal court if we had to take it federal still. And I think that's part of the benefit of being on the GTTF for so long is that I knew what to anticipate from the U.S. Attorney's Office if we had to take it federal, that they would still like the search warrant that I wrote on the state level. So from the time you started putting words on paper till you got the... um um, a- application done, the affidavit done, how long did that take you? Maybe 90 minutes. Yeah. And I think by the time, so we'll drop the search warrant, you know, get it approved by our district attorney's office, get it approved by my supervisor. Um, it gets pushed up pretty high, obviously. Right. Uh, but we're also trying to work it as quick as we can. Um, I knew I had about an hour time frame because even if we deployed up to his residence in Mesquite, it would still take us an hour to get up there, right? Driving time, no matter what. Um, and I knew Mesquite doesn't have a SWAT team, so it would have to be a Vegas-based SWAT team that ultimately served it. Uh, ultimately, North Las Vegas Police Department helped us out, and they served the first search warrant at his residence. Um, <clears throat> but I stayed down at headquarters building uh, because, again, I had started working the investigation. So they just left me down there and they deployed another counterterrorism team up to Mesquite um, to, you know, do the search warrant and start processing that scene up there as well. So I just stayed down there. It was kind of the singular point of intelligence uh, for the counterterrorism section um, until we could get kind of more bodies rallied up and really get a grasp on what was going on. Yeah, because I think, you know, uh, the numbers kind of vary, but at least the one I had is that 60 people lost their lives. I think it was 413 wounded from the gunfire and then uh, about another 400 more just from injuries around everything. I mean, you talk about taxing the ER, Mm -hmm. the the medical community, the hospitals, the ambulances. There's a story about one of the ER doctors. We tried to get him on, uh, tried to find him because he he worked on a lot of the victims. But I mean, this is a mass casualty event. I mean, you have disaster plans, but nobody really has a catastrophe plan. This is kind of crossing into that catastrophe thing to where everything now has been stretched to its limits, right? Between fire, police, emergency, medical, intelligence. I mean, had you seen, uh, obviously you hadn't seen anything like this before, but I can't think of very few events that would tax things the way that they did for you guys that day. No. And I think, you know, we're a fairly large agency. Um, We all integrate very well with fire and EMS. Uh, We do tabletops and we train regularly. 
But, you know, when I teach the October 1 class uh, and kind of go, go over the debriefing of it um, to law enforcement, you know, no matter how much you train for this, no matter how much you do incident command system training, no matter how familiar you are with it, you're never prepared. Uh, it's going to be controlled chaos. And I, 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 you know, personally feel it was controlled chaos for probably the first 48 to 72 hours before stuff started really to settle down. And we really, you know, kind of everybody got together in one kind of central command and we figured out, you know, who was leading what on the investigation. But um, I can't remember, you know, I remember drafting the search warrant. Um, I remember there being really odd things that people were asking me questions about that were in the, in the room, um, in the, the suspect room at Mandalay Bay um, that I was, you know, again, I was trying to keep it very linear, right? I was trying to keep it very minimalist to get it until so we get a paper, get a search warrant in pocket. Now you don't need, and get you don't need war and peace. You just need enough to Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So get I, in there. Yeah, I was trying to get just enough to get into the door. And again, I knew that I was going to be given some leeway, um, given what was going on. Um, but I don't remember ever really being really aware of all these peripheral things that were going on. Cause I was again, so focused on the investigative part. I mean, the hospital stuff didn't really concern me. The crime scene stuff didn't really concern me. I mean, I was watching it on the news, so I was aware of what was going on, but, um, I, I stayed pretty focused on, uh, on the investigative part and, you know, at least getting us initially into the door of the bad guys residence. And then from there, my dynamic changed quite a bit. Um, you know, yeah. once once kind of the investigation started rolling. Before we talk about that, back up. Just it's more of a procedural question, but because the the shooter, the bad guy, the the POS was in Mandalay Bay. Um, can Mandalay Bay just give you, hey, look, this is our room. You know, you guys can go in there, or did you err on the side of caution there too and get a warrant for the hotel room as well? No, no, no. We did not get a search warrant for that. Um, I believe they probably got one after the fact to go in and process for the evidence. Um, uh, but initially, I mean, no. The, initial, they the went, initial entry is just, that's exigent ex circumstance. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Exigent circumstances and they, they, bl they blast the door and they go in. Yeah. And I think people should understand, too, the extents that this POS went to. In other words, uh, part of the, my understanding is, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but he actually had a camera positioned outside the door. So he had multiple cameras. So he had he initially had been in uh, room 135, uh, and then he got an adjoining room into 134. And the way they sit, they kind of sit in a L-shaped pattern uh, to each other. And so he had, uh, and he was familiar with the hotel. So I think he knew this, right? He knew the logistics and the layout of the hotel because he initially didn't have that room. Um, he initially was given another room, and then he kind of threw a hissy fit with his concierge that he wanted another room. And so they were able to move him uh, to the room that he wanted. Uh, but I think that's very tactical on his part because he, he wanted to look at the venue and he had a specific room and a floor that he was probably familiar with and knew. Um, but he had uh, placed uh, serving carts for room service uh, in front of both doors so he could, and then he had baby monitors on them. So he had a live feed to the uh, both sides of the hallway to see anybody that was coming uh, down the hallway to him, which uh, ultimately came into play when one of the Mandalay Bay security guards got shot uh, when he saw him coming down the hallway. Uh, but he'd also taken out the peepholes in the uh, doors and put cameras in the peepholes as well um, so he could see out. And, you know, when we went back and looked at it, the going the going trend kind of in terrorism was to live feed this stuff, right? To live stream it and you know, get the notoriety on you know Facebook Live or wherever it is. Um, so we were worried that he was potentially recording this and live streaming it somewhere, but um, we never found that. He, he did not do that. He was just looking at a live camera feed, and he had laptops set up in his room so he could see anybody uh, potentially coming down the hallway at him. Well, uh, this, I mean, this guy, typically these shooting events don't last that long. And especially if he's already thinking about committing suicide so he doesn't get arrested. But I mean, look at all the prep he's gone through to the extent of setting up all these cameras. I think I read where he used some kind of L-shaped brackets to, to lock doors so people couldn't get through certain doors. Um, and then we haven't got to it yet, but talking about the, the number of boxes that he brought up to his room on several different days. Yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, he had been prepared. So he had been in Vegas, uh, at another hotel overlooking another concert venue, uh, as early as September 17th. 
so he had been in town, you know, about two weeks preparing at multiple locations, I believe. He'd um, also been they, in Chicago too, right? Was I'm sorry? Mm-hmm. He'd also been in Chicago as well too, right? He, he had, uh, we don't know to what extent he had actually been there. I don't believe he had been there, but he had done quite a bit of research um, at Grand Park uh, um, and he had Googled um, Lollapalooza. So he was looking at that concert venue as well. In which that'll get into us later talking about the why, you know, uh, which is ultimately one of the biggest questions, you know, people want to answer. But so you, you've got this thing in front of you and I appreciate the way you're talking about it. You know, it reminds me of a story somebody talked about. It was after 9-11 or it may have been the first Trade Center bombing. But um, one of the captain's battalion chiefs or whatever shows up and he's standing outside and, you know, he's directing stuff. And somebody goes, why aren't you in there helping him? He says, because that's not where I'm valuable. I'm valuable standing back here. Because if I go in, I'm just another body, but back here, I can provide the command and control because that's really kind of what you're providing now is that overview uh, of command and control of, you know, kind of what's going on, at least from your perch. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, I mean, I, I was fairly confident, you know, again, that once I started the investigation that nobody was going to pull me off it. I knew it was going to be a team effort, right? So we had other teams that were coming in to uh, assist us because, again, we had multiple locations that we needed to start doing search warrants for and all the other things um, that we needed to start t- to take a look at uh, with him um, and the girlfriend once uh, ultimately that occurred several days later. Um, but it was really, you know, I, I started it, but it really was a team effort. So, I, you know, I don't want to toot my own horn. Yeah, I don't want to toot my own horn, but, you know, yeah, I mean, the first initial search warrant, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously very proud of the fact that, you know, I was able to author that and get us in the door quickly to, again, try to give us a better grasp on what was actually going on. Players, this is the end of part two. Part three will be coming out next Monday. In the meantime, head on over to GameOfCrimesPodcast.com. That's where we have all of our information about the show. Also, head on over to Apple and Spotify. Hit those five stars on that podcast. Let us know what you think about this episode. Also, follow us on social media at Game of Crimes on Twitter, Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Follow us at Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We have a lot of paid content there in addition to our free content we do on the podcast here. Also, head on over to Facebook.com. Type in Game of Crimes fans, join our fan group, uh, join in some of the additional conversations we have behind the scenes. So guys, thank you for joining us. This is the end of part two. Part three will be coming out next Monday.